that got a lot of attention. Let's bring John Hardy in on all this. John's deputy director of the Russia program at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. Okay, I thought it was worth spending a few minutes because I feel like people gloss over this sometimes. Uh, election interference, what's this? What about this particular case uh, stood out to you, if anything? Well, thanks for having me on. One thing that strikes me is just the way the Russians adapt their influence and in information operation tactics uh, to, to exploit whatever opportunities pre is presented. So in 2016, we had the hacks of the uh, Hillary Clinton campaign, the, the uh, DNC, you know, releasing damaging information in addition, in addition to social media activity. Uh, in 2020, it was kind of laundering narratives through uh, kind of uh, favorable uh, right-wing pundits, uh, some of which, some of whom had, had ties to Ukraine, uh, kind of Russian proxies within Ukraine. Th this year, we see this new scheme, and so you see that the tactics vary, you know, as opportunities present themselves. But ultimately, of course, toward the same objective of dividing Americans and pushing Rus Russian interests, and especially uh, undermining U.S. support for Ukraine. Yep, it was all about Ukraine, or it seemed a lot of it was, and they and they use uh, this company that we talked about in the Russian uh, state company RT, which Matthew Miller, by the way, at the State Department spoke about. Let's listen. An internal planning document created by the Kremlin states that as a goal of the, com of the campaign is securing Russia's preferred outcome in the election. The American people are entitled to know when a foreign power is attempting to exploit our country's free exchange of ideas in order to send around its own propaganda. We now know that RT, formerly known as Russia Today, has moved beyond being simply a media organization. We know that RT has contracted with a private company to pay unwitting Americans millions of dollars to carry the Kremlin's message to influence the U.S. elections and undermine democracy. So how effective is that? I mean, how much influence do influencers have, do you think? I mean, and by the way, the announcement today, the government's charging a former Trump 2016 advisor named Dimitri Symes with working uh, for a sanctioned Russian state TV network and also laundering the proceeds. So that also came out on top of this. How influential are the uh, influence attempts? Yeah, so that's kind of the million dollar question. I, among folks who study this you know, professionally, uh, I think it, it, even then, it's really hard to gauge um, impact, especially if you're trying to, say, count votes. Um, so that's pretty hard to do. I, I think what I like to do is just, you know, like the eyeball test. Um, not necessarily trying to gauge, you know, what was the swing in votes, but could something have made a, a, a you know, legitimate impact? And again, I go back to 2016. If you look at when the Russians released uh, uh, information they had obtained through cyber operations um, that year, uh, it was right after the Hollywood Access tape, and so it was really timed in a way to, uh, you know, have, have maximum effect. And it did; uh, those revelations the Russians released did have, you know, a considerable impact among uh, progressive uh, elements uh, that might have voted for Clinton. So, you know, I, I don't try to uh, put a quantitative measure on it. It's just more of an eyeball test. You know, it is something. Uh, could it have a significant impact? That sounds fair. That could be significant. And yet, you're right. How would you quantify it exactly? It'd be very difficult. John, thank you. John Hardy on what, no matter what you think, is an important story. We'll keep covering it as more comes out on it. Sparks fly, meantime, as a key hearing record.